And I just want to publicly say, I love Mike Bickle. And the Lord speaks to me, and he said, I will change the understanding and expression of Christianity and the whole earth in one generation. There's people that told me not to hang out with them. Like, you know, you know, words like creepy come up. So I knew I was having a supernatural encounter, obviously. I'm standing with a, 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 a mighty demon is in front of me. And, and, and yet, I get to know this guy and I'm going, man, I love his heart. I'm talking about physical destruction of evil systems and evil resource bases coming from heaven. We don't strike them with our hands. We pray, but the military strikes come from heaven. And I just want to publicly say, I love Mike Bickle. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long, and sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Robin. Hi, everyone. So today we are on our second installment of our Exposing IHOP series. Last week we talked about Bob Jones. This week we are talking about Mike Bickle. Right, and we're going to just dive right in. We're going to talk about a little bit about his bio. Then we want to show you a few of his um, testimonies of his visitations and encounters. Mm -hmm. And then we want to finish up with talking about his doctrine. And stick around to the end because, in my opinion, the doctrine, of course, would be the most important. So Mike Bickle was born in 1955. He says he converted to Christianity when he was 15. When he was 20 years old, he was going to college and was invited to become a pastor. So he dropped out of college and became a pastor in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm. Uh, in 1977, he was married. And then in 1982, a man stopped at his church in St. Louis, Missouri. And th that man's name was Augustine Alcala, who claimed that he got an audible word from the Lord that he was to share with Mike Bickle. And the Lord told Alcala four things. Number one, Thousands of young people will rally to you. Two, there will be a full manifestation of gifts of the Spirit for an appointed time. Three, there will be a false prophet in your midst. And four, there will be resistance and misunderstanding. And when they, later on within the movement, they don't even really reveal who that false prophet was, um, even though Bickle thought at first it was Bob Jones. Right. Bickle claims he knows who the false prophet was, mm -hmm. but he didn't want to reveal it. And also Sam Storms, who does a um, a bunch of videos with Remnant Radio talking about the Kansas City prophet, says he knows who the false prophet was, but he wouldn't reveal it. Now, here's what you and I were talking about yeah. earlier. So you had really big immoral problems within the movement. You had Bob Jones' immorality, and you had the immorality of Paul Cain. And these were some very great sins. However, someone that is promoting false prophecy is doing not just, you know, uh, serious harm to the body of Christ, but deadly harm to the body of Christ right. because they are false prophets. Now, of course, we, we do believe that Bob Jones and Paul Cain and John Paul Jackson and the others, they are false prophets. But Bickle would not disclose who the false prophet was. And to me, that's a greater sin than any of the immorality because of the false prophecies. Yes. So. Yeah. So through Augustine's um, revelation to Mike Bickle, Bickle moves back to, he moves to Kansas City. One year later, in March of 1983, Bob Jones knocks on his door and gives him the same four points that Augustine had revealed to him a year earlier. So by 1984, they opened the Kansas City Fellowship. Mm -hmm. It's up and running. Um, they say they started praying six hours a day. By 1990, they joined the Vineyard Movement. Yeah. And that was for a particular reason, wasn't it, Danny? Mm -hmm. They joined the Vineyard Movement because a bunch of negative 
publicity was coming out about the Kansas City profits. A huge report. Yeah, Ernie Gruen's report was the main thing. And Mm -hmm. Ernie Gruen documented some serious harm that the Kansas City uh, profits were doing. And he's got testimony after testimony after testimony. And that document is a result of a sermon that Ernie Gruen preached. And now keep in mind, folks, Ernie Gruen is a charismatic pastor in what I believe is an assemblies was an Assemblies of God church. Mm-hmm. And so here's a charismatic pastor that believes in the uh, in the gifts of the spirit. And he is preaching against the Kansas City prophets. His sermon was called, should we uh, should we keep smiling? Yeah, should we keep smiling and say nothing? And that sermon because of that sermon a two over 250 page Mm -hmm. i believe it was 200 over 200 pages yeah (laughs) was uh written by ernie gruen in a in a document and that document just exploded and it brought a lot of trouble to these uh so-called prophets so there was a lot of back and forth there and Mm -hmm. we do want to share that all with you in another video because it's really really interesting what Mm -hmm. happened One of the results was that John Wimber of the Vineyard said, we are going to have the Kansas City Fellowship become a vineyard church so that they are accountable to some type of authority. And that's what they agreed to do. So that is why Kansas City Fellowship became known as Metro Vineyard Christian Fellowship. And they stayed with the vineyard until 1996 when mike bickle again took them out of that by 1999 mike bickle had this mega church now known as metro christian fellowship like 3,000 members Mm -hmm. he left it to begin ihop kc the international house of prayer yeah and that's when he began that in september of 1999. so let's go ahead and talk about these encounters that Mike Bickle has. Now, Mike Bickle, uh, very close to uh, the his two spiritual fathers, he calls them his spiritual fathers, yeah. would be, of course, Bob Jones, mm-hmm. but also Paul Kane. And so we're going to be talking about Paul Kane in a separate video because uh, I had a really interesting conversation with John Collins today. And John actually did a short five or six minute video with me talking about Paul Kane. So when we get on the Paul Kane uh, portion of this series, you're going to want to hear that. But Paul Kane was a spiritual father to Mike Bickle. And so Mike Bickle, it, just like Bob Jones, just like Paul Kane, just like John Paul Jackson and all the others have has had, well, heaven visitations, angelic visitations, and everything else. We're going to talk about that. And some words from the Lord. Our first clip, Mike Bickle is explaining about when the Lord spoke to him audibly when he was in Cairo, Egypt. And this would have been a few months after Augustine had visited him in St. Louis. I'm going to share an encounter that was the most powerful encounter I've ever had awake. I've had a couple of them not awake or whatever that realm is, but in terms of being awake, and it was in Cairo, Egypt. I've told the story many times over the last 36 years. It was in September 1982. I was in Cairo, Egypt, and I had just finished a a long fast. And my point isn't I finished a long fast. That's not my point. My, My point about that is when you are, are, after a season of fasting, your spirit is so much more tender and you're so much more vulnerable to the Holy Spirit. And when you're in a setting, when, you, when your heart is like that, that after this 21-day fast we're going on starting Monday as a whole community, we're not earning anything, but we will be more tender and more vulnerable and we will hear more and feel more and receive more. It's just how it works. It's just because it tenderizes our spirit. But I was in Cairo, Egypt, and and, I, and, and one of the reasons I was there, I wanted to see the poor of the earth. I'd been to several different cities on this uh, long 30-day trip. I went to India, and I stopped in eight different cities. I believe it was eight. And I went to the slums of each one of those cities. Because after this time of prayer and fasting, I said, and I knew I was moving to Kansas City. I was still living in St. Louis. I was the last 30 days of the seven years we were at St. Louis. And I'm traveling around the world. I finished this long 40-day fast, and my spirit's tender. I'm about to go to Kansas City. And I said, Lord, I just want to take this 30 days, my last 30 days before Kansas City, 
touch me with the poor of the earth. That's what was on my heart. I had no idea the Lord was going to speak to me in Cairo, Egypt about his end time purposes. So I would go to these eight cities in this 30-day trip, and I would go to the slums, and I would go by myself, and I'd just say, Lord, touch me. Mark my heart for the poor of the earth. Mark my heart for the poor of the earth, because I know that that's what the Spirit really wants his end time church to grasp that. And so I'm praying, I'm in a hotel room, and I decide to take the evening and pray. And suddenly, I mean, like, without notice, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon me. And as I've shared the story, it was the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. I've never had, I know what it means to operate in the Spirit of the fear of the Lord in our everyday life. When we're aware that God is watching and what we do, it matters to God. That's, that's a little bit of the fear of the Lord right there. But I'm talking about the Holy Spirit came on me, and I had the dread. I had this weighty, uncomfortable feeling. And it was my, my spirit was trembling, and I don't know what's happening. I'm totally awake. I've never had an encounter like that awake. And the Lord speaks to me, but I call it the internal audible voice of the Lord. It resounded in my being. And he said, I will change the understanding and expression of Christianity and the whole earth in one generation. I mean, it came through me like power. I, it was so uh, clear. I, the phrases, the, I, I sensed even the tonation. I mean, the tone of it. And I was trembling before the Lord. He said, I'm going to change the understanding, expression of Christianity and the whole earth in one generation. And again, I wasn't expecting an encounter. And I knew instantly by the Spirit, I didn't hear this, but I knew instantly when he said, I'm going to change the understanding of Christianity, I knew he meant the way that unbelievers perceive the church, the way they understand it. And instantly it was clear to me. That's what the Spirit was saying. All right. So one of the things that I want to make clear that Bickle is saying here, and I listened to this, he's got a... Um, I don't know, it's about a 12-hour uh, history of IHOP on YouTube. And as I'm listening to this history, and he's talking about this particular uh, uh, thing that the Lord supposedly told him, one of the things he said is that, well, you know, and, I, and I'm not quoting him verbatim here, just off memory, but one of the things he says is, well, you know, right now, unbelievers, they find church boring. And if Christians even find church boring, how much more um, are unbelievers going to find church boring? Well, folks, unbelievers, of course, would find church mm -hmm. boring. But Christians, what, what he's saying about boring, he's saying, oh, you know, these, or you just sit, what, sitting under listening to the Bible being preached and not having all of these miraculous things and, and all of these uh, signs and wonders taking mm -hmm. place in church and all these Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit manifestations. That's the impression that I got as I'm listening to him. But another thing, I remember hearing an audio tape of this Cairo, Egypt um, encounter with God from years ago. And it wasn't from this video, but it was from years ago. And one of the things that he did leave out or seems to leave out in his later um, editions of this story is that when he was there in Egypt and God supposedly come upon him and he's talking about trembling, he was talking about literally shaking uncontrollably on the floor like you would see maybe at a Toronto blessing experience or something like that. And he did mention mm. that. So I don't know if he was just trying to hide that, you know, in later editions of the story mm -hmm. or not, but I do specifically remember hearing him tell it that way. Wow. Um, in the clip I noticed he mentioned fasting, and Mike mm -hmm. Bickle focuses a lot yes. on fasting. He says that fasting will not bring you blessings, but it will put you in a place where God is more likely to bless, bless you. you. So <laughs> that's I mean, really how like he explains it. One side it. of his mouth to the other. Anyway. Oh, my. So you will hear if you are in a position where you're going to listen to a lot of Mike Bickle, you will hear him talk a lot about fasting and mm -hmm. how his the IHOP has these solemn assemblies mm -hmm. or he brings a solemn assembly to the city where it's a 21-day fast. Yeah, absolutely. So we have another clip um, yep. where he is talking to Bob Jones in the 1988 tape series that we listen to a lot during our Bob Jones video. And Mike Bickle is talking about one of his encounters in heaven. And then what happened? 
is I start falling so rapidly. You like shh. It takes me about five to six seconds, and I fall down to my bed, right through the ceiling. I mean, I went right through the wall of the ceiling. Shoo, I hit my bed, and it wasn't like an instant I was there. I, I had this. I had the knowledge of travel for five to six seconds. Have you had that? Yes. And uh, and I was falling so rapidly, and I was going like ah. I was coming right down to the black skies. I was going ah. I remember it wasn't funny at the time. And it's the most holy thing ever happened to me, but I guess it's humor to you guys. But, and uh, I come right through the ceiling, and I hit my bed, and I look for like a half a second, and I go sh right back up again. I go, ah! And I go straight back up again, right through the ceiling again. And I just saw my bed for one second, and I went straight back up again. And there I was, and I was in the courtroom again, and oh, I was trembling because I was, I go, oh, no. And I was just like this brace, you know, to, to get it. It was a horrible feeling. I was so sick in my heart with sorrow because he rebuked me so sternly. He said, much harm and great turmoil to many, many people if you are impatient. And I understood immediately the impatience was related to setting in leadership premature without permission. Yes. He says, you cannot put, he didn't tell me this, I knew this intuitively. You cannot put leadership in that I do not say because that leadership will divide and cause much division and many people will suffer great harm and I will hold you accountable for it. And I knew that intuitively, though he didn't say that. I understood clearly what he was saying to me. And he says, do not look by the natural eye. Don't judge by the hearing of the ear, but by revelation only can you put leadership in, or there'll be great harm and much turmoil to many, many peoples in many places. And I remember I was going, oh, God, I won't do this. I won't do So then I'm standing there again at his left hand again, and I can't look up there. But as always, you don't want to look up there. I, I did not want to look that direction. That was for sure. And I looked over at the left, and all of a sudden, there was this the great opening, vast opening there, and there was the, there were golden chariots. There were golden chariots that, 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 that appeared right there. And I remember looking at them, and there was a whole line of them. And it was the 35. I didn't, couldn't count 35. I just knew it was 20 or 30, because I could only look at them. And there was a whole line of men there. I couldn't look at any of their faces. And I was staring at it like this. I didn't know what was going on. I just was looking straight forward. And the Lord... Uh, Called, uh, he called me young man. He's, that's, that's what he calls me, I guess. Uh, anyway. And uh, uh, so what happens is this golden chariot, it appears, and it comes right there. And the Lord said, get in it. And I, under, I knew intuitively, instantly, it was an apostolic ministry. Yeah. Though it's only the invitation. It was not a commission. The Lord was not calling me an apostle. He said, he was saying, in the days to come, if you're faithful, you have an opportunity in the grace of God to fill an apostolic calling if you're faithful to the full measure. All right. So the irony here is so thick, I can cut it with a knife. So he's talking about how God tells him or yeah, the Lord tells him that uh, he's not to put leaders in that God didn't tell him to put in. So God told him to put Bob Jones in. God told him to put Paul Cain in. All of these false prophets that come into the whole picture here with the Kansas City prophets, supposedly God tells Mike Bickle, you know, you want to be careful. You don't want to bring in people who uh, are going to harm the body of Christ and look right. what has happened. So they would have been by revelation only. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, he mentions the 35 chariots, and he talks about this at another time, mm -hmm. that there are 35 golden chariots, and they represent apostolic teams for the end times. So they're, and he and Bob Jones were discussing this, that they have these apostolic teams. So obviously, Mike Bickle is prepping to become An one of yeah. the leading apostles. Yep, yep. And I, you know, I don't think I've ever heard him call himself an apostle, but through just listening to that clip, you can tell that that's kind of where he's going. Anyway. Um, but wait, there's more. Yes. And here's the second part of that clip. I was screaming. I was screaming, no, no. And the Lord said, get in the chariot. And uh, I remember I hated it because I saw the sin in my life in the presence of God. And I saw the glory of the calling. And I was screaming, no, no. It was exactly opposite of what I thought I would have done. I would have thought I would have said, give me two. And it didn't work that way at all. And I was weeping and I fell on the ground. And the Lord spoke to me sternly yet another time. And I think that there's something prophetic about the weakness of my life because the Lord has to speak. He said, it's been ordained for you. Get in the chariot. He said it harshly to me again. It was a rebuke. And the only thing I can interpret, there'll be a time when I will want to draw back from that which God called because of the 
the uh, dimension of pressure that would be involved in it. That's all I could understand it to me. I said, no. And he said, it's ordained for you. Get in the chariot. And I sit in the chariot, and I went, wa- I went shooting right into a blue sky, and I knew as I was going up that it was revelation. He said, I'm going to bring you into divine revelation oh, in the days amen. to come. And then as I was going up, I barely peeked over my shoulder, and the next guy, the chariot, I, I heard the chariot go, shoo! You know, it's like there was a whole line of them, you know, kind of like at a, uh, 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 some, you know, place where they have circus rides, you know, shoo! And then and I, I heard it go, whoo! And I, I saw, and I heard the guy, I peeked over my shoulder and saw him on the ground, and he was screaming, no, no, <laughs> exactly. He was screaming, no, and the Lord, I, I could barely, barely hear him. He said, I could barely hear the mumble. You know, it was like he was getting yelled at, but I couldn't hear the word. And, uh, and as I was going up, he was following me in the next one. The guy was going, no, no, you know, and they just, every one of them. And the Lord allowed me to know that that was the promise. He promised that there would be in time the end time measure of apostolic ministry that would come out of the fruit of the intercession the prayer of the people to release champions and faithful ones Amen. to the earth he said i will answer that prayer to this people though it won't be like the vessels that god calls i feel real funny telling you that because of my particular uh role in that but i figure it's going to be obvious in the next 10 or 15 years anyway i feel like it's a number of years down the road and uh but the lord said this i'm going to bring forth apostles champions if the people will live in intercession and ask for them to come. So this is the birth of the apostolic ministry, I guess, in Mike Bickle's life or in, in, you know, in the end times movement. Now, folks, think about this for a second. Listen to how silly. Have you ever just noticed how silly some of these um, visions that these charismatic leaders have of heaven or of angels or of Jesus? And... That did Com- sound like a fair ride. It, it really did. And compare mm-hmm. what these modern day charismatic leaders, the visions of heaven and Jesus and other things, angels, to what the Old Testament and New Testament folks who did really have visions, compare that to what these guys are having night and day, night and mm-hmm. day. You're right. Um, He mentions, and Danny, you commented on this. He tells Mike Bickle, the Lord tells Mike Bickle, I'm going Mm -hmm. to bring you into divine revelation, which would, as you made a comment, make Mike Bickle a prophet. So Mike Bickle adamantly, adamantly says he was not part, he was not one of the Kansas City prophets. And he also says that the term Kansas City prophets was not something that he gave the movement or anything like that, but it was something that uh, it was coined from a, a, a book that was written. Um, Some say it in the 90s. Yeah. Pictus. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so that's where he says the term come from. But he says he was never he, he, he isn't a prophet and he wasn't part of it. But if God is speaking to him and giving him direct revelation and he's re, you know, he's talking about that to mm-hmm. the church, giving that revelation to the church and teaching it makes him a prophet. All right, so you may notice something a little bit different about us. While we were recording, our camera completely died. So the only way we could finish this video is to hook up uh, our iPhone, and um, hopefully that uh, that will take care of the problem. So we're going to move on now. Hopefully we're up and running again. Yes, absolutely. Um, Mike Bickle had one more encounter that we want to share with you, and this one was with an angel. In September 2005, it's my other big experience in the last few years, I saw an angel with my eyes. Now, this is right. This is, you know, a once in a lifetime deal too. I've had two once in a lifetime deals in the last, this was September 2005. I looked up and with my eyes, not in a dream, not in a vision, with my eyes wide open, I saw an angel stand in my room, three o'clock in the morning or whatever. I didn't really look at the clock, but it was middle of the night. And he put a trumpet to his mouth. This angel did. And the trumpet did not touch his lips. And I am staring. And again, I am completely captivated. I can't believe I'm seeing an angel. I can't even see what he's doing because I'm so confused that I'm seeing this. And I'm staring. He does not look at me. He looks straight up. He puts his mouth, the trumpet does not touch his lips. Then it goes away. I thought, whoa, what was that? 
A moment later, he's back. He's not looking at me. He's looking in another direction. He puts the trumpet to his mouth, does not touch his lips. I am so in turmoil. I'm white, obviously wide awake, but I'm in turmoil. I go, I don't know well, what's going on. And then a moment later, it happened the third time. Obviously, I'm up for the day. I go in the other room. I go, what is this? This is September 2005. It's the only time I've ever seen an angel face to face awake. Had an, an ang angelic experience or two in a dream state, one or two over the years. Face to face, awake. I mean, he didn't look at me, but I looked at him. And clearly, from Numbers 10, the trumpet has two big meanings, more, but two big meanings. The trumpet is the warning that disaster is coming, and the trumpet is the rallying call to gather to the temple, to the house of prayer. And the meaning was clear. Two things are happening in the land right now. Disaster is coming. Along with the glory of God, there will be moments of disaster that are far beyond 911 and Katrina. Disasters far beyond them are coming to America. And a great revival is coming to America. But also, the trumpet does it not just mean disaster. It means, I will rally the houses of prayer. I will blow my trumpet. The intercessors will gather. They will fill stadiums. They will fill back rooms in the marketplace. They will fill auditoriums in the high schools. I am blowing a trumpet myself, says the Lord. And I will gather the people and solemn assemblies, one day long solemn assemblies, 21 day solemn assemblies, they are going to fill the land in this season that's ahead of us in this next decade or two. All right. So as you can see, Mike Bickle had an, ange an angelic encounter there. Of course, who, who doesn't have angelic <laughs> encounters, encounters? I have them all the time. And of course, I ask the same question. Hey, Angel, you know, what, what, wow, this is incredible. Instead of like most people people do they are scared to death when they have an angelic encounter mike bickle and bob jones you know they just oh wow look at this everyday events so anyway if you notice mike bickle mentioned stadiums and he mentioned state filling stadiums a lot because it was prophesied to him that he would be filling stadiums and at the end times stadiums of young people will be filled so he frequently brings that imagery in well, yeah, and that's because of the doctrine that um, God is raising up the, the these this end time army of young people that are going to be just in, in the last days doing these incredible signs and wonders and you know rallying together in worship to bring Christ back. Right. So right, and please notice he mentioned the solemn assemblies. Mm -hmm. We discussed that with fasting that that he brings those about, and he talked about that again in this encounter. Yeah. Now, another thing that we need to mention before we move on to Mike Bickle's uh, doctrine is that he is literally connected to the Toronto Blessing and Rodney Howard Brown's Laughing Revival. And he talks about that. He talks about actually right. being a part of that. And one of the things you need to know is that, well, God told Mike Bickle personally, you need to accept Toronto. Watch this clip. It starts in January uh, 94. And, and about April, May, June, right in there, right at the 10-year mark, they're starting to have their first conferences right in there, whatever. I don't know the exact date, but it's right at that time. Everybody's going. And uh, so we go up there. You know, I go, okay, good. There's wine. And then the other guy is Rodney Howard Brown from South Africa. He's down in uh, Lakeland, Florida. Actually, his was in 83, and it just starts off. But he hasn't been launched to the nation yet. And just about 1984, I mean 1994, right about the 10-year mark, spring of 94, we have one aiming for the kind of the third waivers, you know, the Vineyardite, third wave, denominational people, that's Toronto. And we got one wine, a cupbearer, uh, ministering to the Pentecostal denominations, the Assembly of God, the Faith Movement, it's Rodney Howard Brown. The Lord says, I'm raised up a cupbearer for both groups, because normally those groups don't receive from each other that well. And so uh, it was, and, and Bob uh, told me, that. he goes, well, this is the Lord's grace. So I'm so excited. So I go to my first meetings. I come home, Bob says, what do you think? I go, I went to Rodney and I went to uh, Toronto. I go, oh, I go, 
oh man, I'm like a fiery intercessor, passion for Jesus revival guy. I go, this thing is, I go, this is a little hard to take, you know, because it was just so laid back and it had a spirit of flippancy most, I mean, all through it and just light and easy and just, uh, just a lot of this and a lot of that and a lot of everything. I, and I don't mean just those two places everywhere. It just wasn't suited, suited for my personality. I'm got a little bit more on the intense side. And so I'm thinking, I go, Bob, how long is this going to be here? And he says, it's here to stay. The, the wine's not going away. The Lord's going to add fire to it. He's going to add wind to it. I think, well, let's get with it. And uh, I mean, if this is what it is, let's go for it, you know. But again, I grew up on Finney, Wesley, Whitfield, Brainerd, Edwards. They didn't do this stuff. Well, a little bit they did, but it wasn't. The meetings were very, very different than I was picturing all these years waiting. Then my friend Jack Deere, uh, he goes up and he goes, Mike, he goes, I don't really like it, to be honest. I mean, he goes to a couple of the different meetings. Again, I'm not saying this city versus that city. There's, they're all over everywhere. He goes, it's not really my style. And uh, Paul Kane uh, goes and and uh, then the lord visits him in a very very powerful way because he told jack he goes yeah i agree it's not my style but the lord uh visits him and says this is my will and he said this is what i am doing and uh you must accept it and you must go with it because the lord is creating a line of demarcation the lord is on purpose offending minds to reveal hearts all right first of all first things first God tells Paul Cain to relay to Bickle and others, this is my will. Think about that for a minute. God is telling Paul Cain that Toronto the was Toronto the Toronto blessing filled with all kinds of craziness was the will of God. Hello. <laughs> do you feel that you need to do that? <laughs> I can't do anything about it. Folks, this is blasphemy. And Mike Bickle is, it, it did not hear that from God whatsoever. God never told Paul Cain that this is the will of God. If Paul Cain heard something from God, it wasn't God that was speaking to Paul Cain. It was something totally different because the Toronto blessing was not of God. So we want to talk a little bit about um, some of Mike Bickle's doctrinal stands also. Um, the first one would be on prayer. And we have a clip where he's talking about prayer and the end times. We're an inch deep. I mean, we're just this deep and it's soft what we're doing. There's not a weightiness to it. There's not a clarity to it. And, there, and there's a crisis emerging in our nation. Not just a crisis happening now. We're getting closer to the end time plan of God, the battle plan unfolding, the one that's in the book of Revelation and in Isaiah and Jeremiah and all the prophets. And, and there are a, there's a number of really crystal clear precepts or principles or or things that God wants done. And he's not going to do them except for the praying church prays them and releases them. But if the praying church doesn't even know about them, how are they going to release them? I think the prayer movement, this is sound a little negative, though I appreciate the prayer movement. I really do. I, it's dear to God. I think the prayer movement globally is not really in sync, hardly with even with those, what's on the Lord's heart. A little bit. I mean, he loves them and they love him. Their sincerity. I'm talking about IHOP too. He's looking down saying, I have so many more things that I have called you for. I want to do more than make your ministries a little more lively, get a little, give you a little bit more money and change a couple of laws. I have so much more in my heart. I want to transition human history to the age to come. We've got to get a vision that's beyond changing a couple of laws, getting some supernatural financing and getting some, a few healings in our meetings and some soul saved. Critical that we get all those. I, I don't ever want to not get those. Sure. I want to change a bunch of laws, get lots of money, a lot of souls saved. But beloved, I'm talking about Jesus wants the prayer movement to be at the point of the arrow to shift history to the age to come. And there's national and international issues that the prayer movement needs to lose. And I don't mean, I'm not just talking about praying and the guys over there change the law. I'm talking about the stuff Moses did. Moses prayed and the heavenly arsenal 
from heaven struck the military bases of Pharaoh. I'm talking about physical destruction of evil systems and evil resource bases coming from heaven. We don't strike them with our hands. We pray, but the military strikes come from heaven. Moses is the only guy that did a bunch of them. Lots of stuff wrong with that clip. Now, that is a clip from the One Thing Conference, I believe, in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and Bickle says something there about military strikes. What does he say? He mentions he's talking about the praying church making things happen that will release things from heaven. And he then compares that to Moses who prayed and God destroyed Pharaoh and his army. And that's going to happen with us. If we pray, God will destroy those evil systems. Yeah, but we have to be praying 24-7. We have to get together. We, You know, the prayer movement right now, that's not enough. We got to all be, you know, just, just hunkered down and praying 24-7. We've got to get in these houses of prayers. There's got to be houses of prayer all over the nations. First of all, you and I were talking about this clip earlier. And you said, wait a minute, doesn't the Bible tell us that we're supposed to love our enemies? And that's exactly right. So Romans 13 comes into play here because we are to obey the governing authorities that God himself has set up before us. We're not to pray destruction down on anyone. This is not God's will. So he's got this whole idea, yeah, and, and it falls along with the whole uh, Manifest Sons of God, Joel's Army thing, and we'll talk about that when we get right. into the doctrine here a little bit deeper, but you get my drift. Yeah. We're actually going to talk about it um, right now. We're going to talk a little bit about Joel's Army, but first we have a clip where Mike Bickle is talking about this superior bloodline. Bob said... I'm going to, I'm still in paragraph B, I'm going to send out these draft letters to my leaders. And he told him many of them are very, are very young and many of them are yet in the future. I'm going to call people from all over the world and I'm going to begin in earnest to call them in 1979. Where were you in 1979? Half of IHOP says, not born yet. <laughs> That's a good answer because the Lord spoke. Many of them are not born yet. But here's what the Lord told him. Here's the part that touches me. He said, Bob, in the next generation, the Lord says, look at paragraph C, I'm going to bring forth the best of the bloodlines of many, many families through history. I'm saving the best of their bloodlines for the generation that my son returns. And he's told them, he said, they will move in a measure of the spirit beyond all the other generations, far beyond all the other revivals. And the Lord says, I'm saving the best of the bloodlines for out of the sands of time, I have called them for such a time as this. And he said, Bob, this is your assignment to touch some of these early leaders in your day, but this will happen after your day. But out of the sands of times, I have ordained this coming generation to be the best of the bloodlines of their generation to move in holiness and power and to magnify Jesus. Amen and amen. So, Danny, um, Mike Bickle talks about this superior bloodline. Mm -hmm. If you watched our Bob Jones video, Bob Jones had what we called the jelly bean prophecy, where he was taken into heaven and the angels were pulling out these, they were looking at all these yellow blobs, which looked like jelly beans, and they were pulling out the best ones. Yeah. And that was kind of like the superior bloodline or reminding us of the manifest sons of God. Yeah. And folks, they get this stuff from Joel chapter two, verses 12 through 16. This whole Joel's army thing, this whole idea that, um, you know, these God wants this solemn assembly, this 24 hour house of prayer and all that stuff. And it this chapter has nothing to do with that. They literally force their theology into this chapter of Scripture. They, it's like it doesn't fit, but they force it in. And um, so let's go ahead and, and read that passage. Okay. Joel 2, 12 through 16. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Yeah, they say this is a double prophecy. And who told them this was a double prophecy? I suppose they got it from, you know, extra biblical revelation. Probably. Um, When I was reading about Joel's army, and we'll probably do a video on that, at least a short video at some point, but um, there are two ways to interpret that Joel passage that the Joel's army people use. One is that we're going to go in with force and take over the world, almost like a Mm -hmm. strong dominion theology. The second one is that we will take it in much like Mike Bickle was explaining with prayer and fasting and God will do all of the violent work. So either way, there's violent work, whether it's, uh, whether it's through prayer and God doing it, or whether it's through God using the body of Christ to do it. Right. We have another clip that um, ties right in with this about bringing Jesus back. Then uh, we're clear it's a worldwide movement that we're laboring for. And and that's important because you do it different if you think it's going to be a a local church revival or a worldwide movement. Now, not a worldwide movement that we're single-handedly birthing because we believe in the international family of affection, something the Lord spoke very strong on a number of occasions. We're doing this together with our brothers and sisters in China and South America and, and, uh, and Africa and all over Asia and Europe. Every, we're in this together. So the things I'm talking about, yeah, though we have a real important mandate in Kansas City and in the Midwest, very, very focused mandate, Uh, we are in this thing with the whole body of Christ that's saying yes in their local areas to the same kind of truths and things that are going on. So now we know that we're laboring for something more than a local break-in of the power of God. We're laboring for something that's going to result in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Folks, if you've not believed that Mike Bickle's whole agenda through this 24-hour prayer movement isn't to bring back the Lord Jesus Christ— You heard it right there in that clip. That's exactly what they're trying to do. And I did not know there was an international family of affection. That's a new one. That's a new one on me, too. Um, So let's talk a little bit about the manifest sons of God and how that would tie into this. Now, on Mike Bickle's website, he will say that we do not agree with the theology of the manifest sons of God. But when he is sharing his views, Mm -hmm. it seems to be right in line with it. Um, First of all, a brief definition of who the manifest sons of God are. The Manifest Sons of God is a false teaching, defining belief of the latter rain movement. It claims that an elite group of believers will be revealed in the end times to prepare the world for millennial reign of Christ. They will have the ability to perform signs, healings, and miracles greater than those of the apostles. They will complete the Great Commission by bringing about the greatest revival of history, converting the majority of the world to Christ. So that seems to go right in line with what Bickle was just saying. Yeah. And, you know, Bickle can say that uh, he doesn't believe in this all he wants. But I mean, when you listen to his theology, that's what you that's the conclusion that you come to. And, you know, like you were talking about, you and I were talking earlier and you had mentioned, you know, I don't I, I think he really does believe it, but he just isn't you know, coming out and, and saying it. I do too. I, I you, you just listening to what he teaches, you can't do anything, but come to the conclusion that he does hold to this uh, whole manifest th- sons of God teaching. So one of the verses, the manifest sons of God, um, adherence use is Romans eight nineteen. for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. That would be the manifest sons of God. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a quote here from Mike Bickle. These quotes are coming from a book that Bickle wrote, and that book is Growing in the Prophetic, a Practical Biblical Guide to Dreams, Visions, and Spiritual Gifts. And in this, Bickle says, 
The increase of prophetic ministry in the local church involves more than verbal inspirational prophecy. It will include angelic visitations, dreams, visions, and signs and wonders in the sky, as well as an increase in prophetic revelation, even the kind given through the subtle impressions of the Holy Spirit. Subtle impressions of the Holy Spirit. Now, that's that phrase, you, you read that over and over again in that book, mm. because Bickle believes, just like all of the other NAR prophets believe that prophecy, well, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate, folks. You can get it wrong because, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to, uh, by faith, hear the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, we have to kind of, you know, filter out the, our own thoughts and our own feelings and all of that stuff from the voice of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, let's read a little bit about how he differentiates between Old Testament prophecy and New mm -hmm. Testament prophecy. Bickle states, in the Old Testament, there was prophetic concentration, and in the New Testament, there was prophetic distribution. The fate of the church would never depend on the accuracy of one prophet. With potentially several or even a number of prophets in each geographic location, the same kind of accuracy of revelation is not needed because of the safeguard of other prophets' mandate to judge each other's words and even spirit-anointed believers' ability to test discern, confirm, or deny a claim of revelation. So then he, after that quote, he puts 1 Corinthians 14, 29 as one of his proof texts, and we'd like to read that for you. Okay, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 through 33. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So Bickle and others in the charismatic movement believe that every single believer can prophesy. And Danny, they use verse 31 in there, which really doesn't make sense. It says, for you can all prophesy one by one. When, when you're reading it in context, you know, He's talking about the prophets that he was talking to in the verses right before that. Yeah, and look what it says. It says, um, uh, but if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak uh, to himself and God. Mm -hmm. Let two or three prophets speak. So the Bible makes it very, very clear that not all have the gift of prophecy. And that's why Paul calls these people that are prophesying in this passage prophets because it's those with the gift of prophecy that are doing the prophesying and danny verse 29 let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said um you had brought that up if we go back to mike bickle's comments he said that prophets can basically be inaccurate because other prophets are to judge what that prophet is saying. So we don't necessarily have to trust them because we'll have that other panel of prophets to say, well, this is probably true. This is probably not true. And we can go with that. Yeah. Remember, everybody can prophesy. So, you know, you need somebody to kind of muddle through all of the you stuff and the Holy Spirit stuff to make sense of everything. Yes. But the problem is this passage, once again, is speaking specifically to prophets with the gift of prophecy who are prophesying in the meeting. And so Paul calls them prophets, but the Bible makes it clear that not everyone has the gift of prophecy. And that's not in the Old Testament, folks. That's in the New Testament. Right. So let's go ahead and look at another Bickle quote about prophecy. The essence of Old Testament prophetic ministry was limited to those who received direct revelation from God. In the New Testament, we prophesy by faith, which involves speaking out the subtle impressions that the Holy Spirit gives us. We learn to prophesy according to the measure of our faith. Thus, we can mix up God's ideas with our words and thoughts. For as Romans 12, 6 says, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Moving on, um, Mike Bickle has some things to say about comparing the priesthood of believers with 
prophets and prophecy. And we read, over the 1500 years that followed after the day of Pentecost, many reverted back to the Old Testament understanding of the priesthood by elevating it to include only full-time clergy. Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk and a priest, was troubled by this Old Testament understanding of the priesthood. The priests were few and exclusive. Luther taught the doctrine that we know today as the priesthood of the believer. This New Testament understanding of priesthood is an accepted foundation of evangelical theology, but in his day it was radical enough to get him condemned to death. Luther also taught the doctrine of private judgment, which is the principle that every believer can hear God and interpret the scriptures for himself. That was another radical idea for the 16th century. There are parallels in Luther's emphasis on the priesthood of all believers to the New Testament understanding of prophetic ministry. Even Christians can hear from God, exercise discernment, excuse me, every Christian can hear from God exercise discernment, and be led by the Holy Spirit, ministry that was exclusive in the Old Testament, prophet and priest, is now diffused and common in the new. Okay, so let me just say this about Martin Luther. First of all, yes, Martin Luther did talk about the priesthood of the believer. Um, You can read his book, The Freedom of the Christian. He talks about it in that book. Martin Luther's primary focus was on justification by grace alone through faith alone. I just want to make that very, very clear. Secondly, um, there is no parallel between the priesthood of all believers and every believer being able to prophesy. You can't find that connection in Scripture. You can't say it parallels because there's nothing there. None of the apostles mention uh, the, the, the priest, and Peter is the one who talks about this whole idea of the priesthood of every believer, but you don't find him talking about prophecy and the priesthood of, belie- of the believer in the same um, context. It just doesn't happen. And so Bickle is absolutely wrong about that. There's nothing, there's no connection between the two. Bickle would disagree. He goes on to say, New Testament prophetic ministry is an extension of this idea that we are all priests and therefore we can all hear from God. The focus of most prophesying is on edification, exhortation, and comfort, 1 Corinthians 14, 3. In fact, everyone who is born again is able to prophesy on this level, which I have referred to as level one prophecy. This is often referred to as inspirational prophecy or simple prophecy. I'm going to let you talk about inspirational versus simple in just a second, but let me say this really quickly. Um, Every believer can hear from God, definitely, truly can hear from God every day, every moment of the day, if you memorize God's word, because how do we hear from God? Well, we open up our Bibles and we read it. When we are reading our Bibles, we are reading the very words of God. And the apostles themselves, the old, I mean, the New Testament apostles, the apostle Paul, the apostle Peter, and those others who were close companions of the apostles who wrote scripture, they are still speaking today. The apostles and prophets are still speaking today through the word of God. So yes, every Christian can hear the voice of God, but they hear it by reading the Word of God or by sitting in the uh, divine service and hearing the pastor preach the Word of God, speak the Word of God. That's how they hear God's Word, not through direct revelation, subtle impressions, or anything like that, because the problem with those things, and we've said this, Robin, over and Mm -hmm. over again, the problem with those things are, how do you test them? Well, we open up the scripture and we test it by scripture. Okay, then if it's there in scripture, why did you need to hear it in your heart? You you don't, you know, you have nothing objective to base anything that you hear inside that it was, you know, the Holy Spirit. You're right. Um, The inspirational prophecy or simple prophecy is just Bickle's way of uh, having levels of the prophetic. So an immature prophecy. A Christian who's immature in the prophetic would be at that simple prophecy level where Mm -hmm. maybe you get an impression or you get an idea. And uh, many of these prophets, prophets, um, will just tell you it's like a muscle you need to exercise, get around people who know what they're doing, get trained, become stronger and stronger in the prophetic. 
Mm. Um, we wanted to read First Corinthians twelve twenty seven through thirty one. Right? Yeah. Now. Can I just say something that's on my please? On my mind, <laughs> folks. Um, it's it's really a dangerous thing to say. I have a word from the Lord. It is so dangerous unless you are preaching from Scripture, saying here here's, here's my word, word from the Lord. Mm. From the Lord, if you are saying God spoke to me specifically, and it's not from God, the Bible warns that God God hates that mm. because it's 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 false prophecy, even if it's something very subtle, like Bickle talks about. So it's just a very dangerous thing, right? Um, this scripture has to do with whether or not we are all prophets. First Corinthians 12, 27 through 31. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. So right there, that passage says, are all prophets? And that it's it's a rhetorical question. Paul knows the answer. The answer is no. That's the point. No, not all are prophets. No, not all have the gift of tongues. No, not all have the gift of healing. The point is, is that right. the God had given gifts to the body of Christ individually um, to build up and edify the body of Christ. Not everyone has the same gift. Very good. Because Mike Bickle um, is so focused on the prophetic, he has a lot to say about it. Um, this next quote is on the now word or the rhema word of the Lord. One purpose of the prophetic ministry is to alert the church to the nowness of the Holy Spirit. It awakens us to the purpose of God in the present, what he specifically wants to do in us and through us now. In other words, it is the now word of the Lord. Of course, it must always go with the written word of the Lord. God wants to bring the word and the spirit together in the church. The Bible makes it clear already what God wants us to do. He wants us to live holy and godly lives. He wants us to live lives that serve and love our neighbor. He doesn't, it, it, there's, you know, there's no way to objectively test these now words. So like you were saying, you go to one church and you hear a now word, and then you go to another church and you hear a totally different now word. How do you, that, how do you determine which now word you're supposed to obey? And Danny, how does the body of Christ keep up with all of the now words that are being given to us at this point in time? Exactly. And how is a now word not a something that is coming from God himself? And if this pastor, let's take Mike Bickle's whole eschatology, for example. Right. If Mike Bickle is tr correct, we better all be joining an international house of prayer somewhere because we better be doing exactly what God says to do, or we have lost it. We are not living in God's will. And so, well, it, if we're part of the international family of affection, we will be in an international no, house of prayer, whatever that means. But so, so yeah, I mean, it's just this, this whole now word, how do you judge? Yeah. One last quote from Mike Bickle. Typically, Christians in our day limit the meaning of contending for the faith to fighting for the sound doctrine and sometimes including righteous living. While fighting for sound doctrine and living holy before the Lord are good pursuits, there is more to contending for apostolic faith than Ju that Jude describes than laboring only to have good theology and holy lifestyles. I can only imagine Jude's response to a believer in the 21st century telling Jude, that he only wants sound doctrine and a godly lifestyle, but he doesn't want or need to heal the sick, cast out demons, or and prophesy regularly. I am certain Jude would correct him and say, if you only had right dogma and live righteously, but don't demonstrate the power of the doctrine and the outworking of righteousness, then you aren't fully contending for the faith. It is not enough to have good doctrine with a clean life. That's only part of the equation. We need to have the power to deliver the oppressed and the 
the needy with a prophetic word. At the same time, it's not enough to experience power in ministry while living in secret sin or espousing false doctrine. We must contend for all three elements of true apostolic faith, biblical ideas, biblical lifestyles, and biblical experience. With all of this talk of eschatology, prophecy, 24-hour prayer, um, all of this bickle, IHOP theology, this is doing nothing but taking people's eyes off the gospel, which is what we need more than anything else. And it's ironic that he uses and talks about Jude. Let me just read you just a little bit about what Jude says in his epistle. He says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, Although I was very eager to write you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Why is that? He says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny the master and Lord Jesus Christ. And so he goes on to describe these people. And look what he says. Yet in like, verse 8, yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme the glorious ones. Does that not remind you of what's going on in IHOP? You've got Bickle relying on the prophecies of Bob Jones and Paul Kane, their dreams and their visions, and he's relying on those. Um, They've rejected authority because they've come out of what the vineyard, uh, a whole vineyard thing. And so Mike Bickle mm-hmm. and those are, those guys are just kind of, um, uh, I don't know, rogue, gone rogue on their, doing right. their own thing. Um, and they slander the glorious ones. They're, they're, they're always talking about these, you know, the, the angels and, and all of these other visions that they've had of angels and even demons. They have no idea what they are talking about. Folks, mm-hmm. Mike Bickle. I hop, they are dangerous people. And if you know anybody who is following these men, you need to warn them that they're following false prophets and heretics. Now, we have not done an in-depth uh, video on the theology of IHOP. That's coming up. We're going to do an in-depth video on Joel's army and the manifest sons of God. But this is just kind of a scratch the surface video Mm -hmm. to kind of show you what Mike Bickle believes, who this man actually is. So, folks, I hope this video has helped. Thanks for watching.